Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Current Connect series. In today's episode, we will cover the latest developments for the month of July. So, let's get started. Now, in the ever evolving, evolving uh, landscape of the digital age, the protection of personal data has become a paramount concern, isn't it? Now, let's delve into the recent development that is the passage of India's data protection bill. For your information, India until recently did not have any dedicated law on data protection. The use of personal data was regulated under the Information Technology Act of 2000. In 2017, therefore, the government constituted the BNC Krishna Committee to examine the data protection issue. And following its recommendations, the uh, data protection or the personal data protection bill 2019 was introduced in the Lok Sabha. It is formulated based on the data regulation of European Union, also known as the General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR, which empowers its citizens to have a greater say in how their online data is used. Right. Now let's explore the key details or features of the data protection bill. Firstly, the personal data is defined broadly, which encompass any information identifying an individual. Right. And the bill applies to data, uh, digital personal data, digital personal data that are collected both on online or offline, but in a digitized form. Now, the consent is an important aspect of the bill. Consent. Processing of personal data is allowed only for lawful purposes with individual's own consent, right? And for minors, the parental or guardian uh, consent is mandatory. Data principles or individuals whose data is being pro processed have the rights uh, including obtaining information, seeking correction or eraser and grievance details and all that. Now, data fiduciaries which are entities determining the data pro processing must ensure the accuracy, build a security safeguard and report any breaches to the government. And also government entities have a specific regulations. Now, the bill allows the transfer of personal data outside the India but with certain restrictions that are to be set, set out by the government. However, certain exemptions apply like prevention of offences or enforcement of legal rights etc. To enforce these provisions, the government will establish a data protection board of India and it will monitor the compliance, impose penalties and address the grievances. So, as we move forward, it is crucial to recognize that data is the new world or the currency of the digital age. Proper regulation therefore are required to ensure data security in our increasingly digital economies, isn't it? Next up, in the context of justice, there is a crucial advancement in the right to remain silence. So recently the Supreme Court or the Apex Court reinforced this right by declaring that all accused individuals possess the right to remain silent. Now, this right has its root in Article 20 Clause 3 of the Indian Constitution, which is a provision crafted to shield individuals from self-incrimination. So, let's delve into the nuances of this crucial constitutional protection. Article 20 Clause 3 declares that no one can be compelled to be witnessed against oneself. So, it serves as a shield or, uh, shield or uh, uh, protection, particularly in criminal proceedings, and ensure that an accused person cannot be forced to speak up or admit guilt. Right. However, it is important to note that this protection is exclusive to criminal proceedings only. In certain contexts such as interrogation under the Customs Act of, Act of 1962 or the FEMA or the Foreign Exchange Management Act of 1999, the right to silence may not be applicable. Now, in this context, the Nandini Satpasi vs. E.L. Dhani case highlighted the delicate balance. The code emphasized that compelling an individual to answer questions within the confines of a police station could infringe upon the Article 20 Clause 3. Right. In the recent affirmation of this right, the Supreme Court asserted that the sanctity of an accused person's silence is paramount. Investigators are therefore the investigators, they are barred from uh, coercing any individual to speak against their will or admit guilt in a um, closed environment, right? And in essence, the right to silence is also not just a legal provision, it is a protection that ensures that the accused can choose when to speak and when to remain silent, right? So that is all about the right to remain silent. Now, next, 
in the pursuit of mental well-being a revolutionary step has been taken in the form of india's first daily manus chat book which is an online portal to help people in mental distress this groundbreaking initiative was unveiled during the jammu and kashmir's health conclave underlying underlining the uh, region's commitment to mental health it is operated under the ministry of health and family welfare and has a two tier system which is strategically designed to offer comprehensive mental health support at the first tier we have the state telemana cells these are the frontline warriors basically which are equipped with a team of trained counselors and mental health specialists in the second tier we have a district mental health program for the dmsp along with the medical college resources here the reach expands allowing for physical consultations and as well as leveraging the e sanjeevani portal for audio visual consultations as well and hence the telemanas chatbot uh, opens the door uh, to the round the clock access to mental health specialist and consultants isn't it so that's all about the telemanas portal next up we have uh, moving on to the next topic is about a recent development in the black sea region now let's delve into the details recently russia decided to withdraw from the black sea green team by citing unmet promises and challenges in exporting its agricultural products and fertilizers right this move has sparked renewed discussion and raised questions about the dynamics between nations in the global green market last year in july the united nations and turkey brokered a deal between the two key players in the region which are russia and ukraine the black sea green deal emerged as a response to the escalating food prices and supply chain disruption that occurred due to the ongoing russia ukraine conflict it aimed to address these challenges by creating a safe maritime corridor for ukrainian exports basically particularly for the food grains from its three crucial ports this those are chornomors odessa and yuzhny it was envisioned as a temporary solution and had a defined duration of 120 days only with a provision for extension or termination based on the evolving circumstances in the region and now russia's withdrawal from the deal has introduced a new layer of complexity isn't it according to russia a significant portion of the ukraine's export from the wheat up from the deal went to high and middle economies right with only a minimal percentage reaching to the poor nation and this has fueled the contention and added to a diplomatic dimension to the green deal green deal so as the black sea green deal undergoes this diplomatic evolution the global green market finds itself as a, at a crossroad isn't it and the repercussions of this withdrawal are yet to be unfolded so that's all about the black sea green deal next in a bid to empower women in self help groups and promote the richness of india's handicrafts the dindal antodoy yojana national rural livelihood mission has introduced a transformative tool called the e saras mobile app this initiative focuses on the economic empowerment of women in particularly the self help groups by recognizing their immense potential towards an inclusive growth the e saras mobile app is a digital platform which is designed to be a marketplace for the authentic handicrafts and the handlooms crafted by this skilled sg women This app serves as a bridge that create, connects the creator directly with the potential buyers just like your Amazon shopping app isn't it and it is designed with a user friendliness in mind and this e-saras app allows users to explore a diverse range of local products and for the women and self help groups this app is not 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 only just just a marketplace it's also a gateway to their economic independence isn't it they can showcase their creations uh, to a wider audience they can break geographical barriers and they can find new markets beyond their immediate surroundings right and at its core the e saras app is a catalyst for change by promoting local products and it contributes to the larger goal of enhancing livelihood opportunities for women in central now recently the ministry of rural development presented the bhumi samman award of 2023 This year this prestigious bhumi samman award finds its deserving recipients in nine state secretaries and their dedication and achievements reflected in the success of the digital india land record modernization program or dil rmp which was launched in 
the objective of this program was clear that is to develop a modern comprehensive and a transparent land record management system in its recent extension for 5 years from 2021-22 to 2025-26 the program continues to forge a path towards a more efficient and accountable governance of land records now why does this modernization matter it's not just about digital records it's about reducing the interface between citizens and government functionaries it's about transparency clear land titles that facilitates the capital flow and also a significant reduction in land related dispute right and in the landscape of innovation initiatives like unique land parcel identification number or ul pin and the swamitha scheme are also paving the way for a future where land ownership is just not just a legal concept but a tangible reality for every village household owner isn't it so that's all about the bhumi samman now next up recently the G- gst network or the gstn has added a powerful tool that is the geo coding functionality into its network now imagine it is a digital imagine it as a digital map which can meticulously convert the location descriptions into precise geographic coordinates across every state and union territories of our vast nation now geo coding ensures that the uh, address details in the gstn or the gst network records are not just accurate but also easily verifiable right and it's a move towards a more transparent and efficient tax system but the gstn is not merely a guardian of tax record for your information it it has now entered the realm of finance financial crime prevention as well so the government has included the gstn under the prevention of money laundering act this strategic move allows this uh, sharing of critical information between gst network and the enforcement enforcement director or the ed enforcement director and on other investigative agencies to combat any financial offenses as well and the recent amendment to the 2006 notification is actually a game changer what what it does is it strengthens the provisions under the section 66 of the prevention of money laundering act which provide tax authorities with enhanced tools to unveil the cases of gst fraud and this also reinforces the government's commitment to a transparent accountable and fraud resistant economic system isn't it so that's all about the new uh, uh, geo coding uh, addition to the gst network next up beneath the surface of the indian ocean a mystery has been intriguing scientists which is known as the gravity hole now what exactly is a th- is a gravity hole okay so a gravity hole refers to a large gravity anomaly it is an area where a gravity is significantly different from the surrounding region it is characterized by a substantial decrease in gravitational pull compared to the expected value based on the earth's normal gravitational field and this pronounced dip in the indian ocean is called the indian ocean geoid flow or the iogl which was first time discovered in 1948 and this study suggests that This massive depression might be a remnant of ancient Tethys Ocean, which acted as a bridge between ancient supercontinents of Gondwana and Laurasia. And the study proposes that slabs from the Tethys Ocean may be the cause of the IOGL influencing the geological dynamics beneath the Indian Ocean, isn't it? So that's all about the gravity hole in the Indian Ocean. Next update is on LIGO India, which is a new gravitational wave observatory. and is sent to put india on the research map and contribute to our understanding of the universe so currently there are two lego setups in the us and the third one will be built in ingoli district of maharashtra and the facility of this lego will be uh, constructed or be completed by 2030 now lego stands for laser infrarometer uh, gravitational wave wave observatory lego infrarometer gravitational wave observatory right and it is a physics experiment designed to detect the gravitational waves now what are these gravitational waves so gravitational waves are like ripples in the fabric of space and time that travel at the speed of light and they are created by the motion of massive objects such as black holes neutron stars which generate gravitational waves when they orbit or they collide with each other isn't it and now the gravitational waves are extremely weak and dif- very difficult to detect and therefore they were first time detected uh, by the ligo system in 2015 which is actually a century after they were predicted by einstein's theory of relativity so 
that is the important development about the lego that will be set up in india next update is on india's moon mission as you may already know chandrayaan 3 is india's third moon mission and is a follow up of the chandrayaan 2 which aimed to land a rover on the lunar south pole and the chandrayaan 3 mission will have three major modules the propulsion module which will carry the lander in the rover till the 100 km lunar orbit then the lander module with the capability to soft land and deploy the rover and the rover itself which will carry out in situ chemical analysis for the of the lunar surface right now why isro wants to explore the moon south okay the south pole region is believed to have water molecules in substantial amounts in a frozen form right which is essential for the future human missions isn't it and also the south pole could provide a preserved record of the moon's history and the early solar system evolution and most importantly by undertaking the missions to the uh, far south isro can develop and demonstrate innovative technologies for soft landing navigation resource utilization and long duration operations that can be applied in the future space missions as well and the launch vehicle that was used uh, was lbm3 or launch vehicle mark 3 it was previously known as the gslv mark 3 it is a three stage launch vehicle consisting of two solid propellants on its sides and a core stage comprising of liquid stage and a cryogenic stage and the vehicle is dubbed as one of the heaviest for its ability to carry satellites up to 8000 of 8000 kg right so that's all about the chandrayaan 3 mission next the national tiger conservation authority or the ntca has just unveiled the status of tiger report for the year 2022 let's dive into the key observation from this report so across the 53 tiger reserves which cover only 2.3% of India's land we are safeguarding a remarkable 75% of world's wild tiger population right and notably in central India the Siva Lakes and the Gangetic Plains the tiger numbers are on the rise the survey used advanced tools like aim stripes and camera traps for an intensive protection and accurate ecological status ass assessment of the tigers and global positioning system and remote sensing actually played a crucial role capturing various data sets of our tiger reserves right and also in a significant move the government has launched the project tiger and the project elephant into a single entity named project tiger and elephant division and this merger aims to streamline the funding and enhance the coordination for these crucial conservation projects so now the project tiger and elephant are under the same canopy under the ministry of uh, environment and a forest conservation right next in the pursuit of sustainable future uh, niti ayog introduced uh, uh, the indian climate energy dashboard or iced version 3.0 it is an one stop digital platform that serves as a window into the heart of india's energy landscape it is designed with the user in the mind right and iced 3.0 is more than a dashboard it is an analytical engine actually users can access nearly real time data which can uh, which include you know exploring various data sets of energy climate and economic data sets as well so researchers policy makers and enthusiasts can navigate the complexities of india's energy and climate sectors they can also identify key challenges along the way isn't it and we can say iced 3.0 is a watchtower of india's clean energy transition it monitors the pulse of progress while providing a real-time status check on the journey towards sustainability, isn't it? So that's all about the ICED version 3.0. Now, uh, two uh, important geological updates. First one is a geological marble in Maharashtra's Satara district, that is the Kaas Plateau, which is often referred to as the Valley of Flowers. It falls in the biosphere reserve of the Western Ghats. Uh, its name is derived from the Kas tree or the Kasa tree, uh, which is a uh, member of the Rudraksha family, right? And the plateau is made up of igneous rocks, and in recognition of its ecological richness, the Kas the uh, plateau actually finds its place in the prestigious UNESCO World Natural Heritage Site list under the Western Ghat, right? And then the next topic is on uralite. A study proposes a silicon collision giving birth to the Dhala crater in Madhya Pradesh, which dates back to 2500 to 1700 million years ago. So, if you don't know, then the Dhala crater is Asia's largest and the world's 
seventh largest impact crater. And in India itself, if you know, there are three impact major impact crater or the meteorite impact craters. The other two are Rampard in Rajasthan and the Lunar in Maharashtra. And these urilites are a rare class of primitive meteorites that constitute a tiny fraction of meteorites on the Earth. And they consist of silicate rock, mostly olivine and pyroxene, along with less than 10% carbon in the form of diamond or graphite, along with sulfides, metal sulfides, and a few fine grained silicates. Right? So, that brings us to the end of this episode of the Current Connect. We hope this episode has provided you with the valuable insights and knowledge about these crucial matters. Stay tuned for more updates in our next episode where we will keep you informed about the latest developments in the diverse fields. Thank you for joining us and until the next time, stay curious and keep exploring the world around you.